Welcome to um, History Matters, and I'm going to be truthful here, and so does Gatorade. Oh, yeah, Gatorade. I do not have coffee yet. I, I don't blame you. Gatorade is good when you have a tummy upset. Gatorade is my, like, salvation. I don't mean to, like, have a Gatorade, beverage of champions. I don't mean to be doing a, a TV yeah. show. If now that Gatorade people ship, like, a giant quantity of Gatorade to your doorstep. <laughs> it, it got me through COVID. Me too. It helped me through the norovirus this last week. But at any rate, I am here, and I am happy to be here. I'm very happy to be with you again, rather than, like, filming things in advance and stuff. I very much wanted to be with you guys. Uh, and lo and behold, I'm here. And um, today's topic is, has a conveniently short title, Bad History. Um, and I'm going to be talking about what I mean by bad history uh, and why it's particularly bad and why I thought of it for this week. There are oh, so many reasons. But before I do that, I'm going to turn to my partner in crime. I'm so happy to see you, Annie. I missed everyone uh, who will explain the rules of the game. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm Annie Evans from New American History, and we are delighted, as always, to gather on Friday morning with you to talk about history. We have a very robust chat if you're joining us from Zoom. Uh, we have a community that has developed over the years, and we invite you into that community. If it's your first time, let us know. Uh, but while we are listening to Joanne talk about bad history, if you have specific questions related to today's topic, we'd love for you to put those in the Q&A. And in about 30 minutes, that's where I'll be checking to start off the question and answer part of our program. Thanks for joining us. Excellent. Um, and I truly cannot say what is on Newbie's mind, but I think we're going to hear a lot from Newbie today. Okay. Um, and uh, as... <laughs> I cannot answer the question as to what Gatorade is made of, and I am not going to talk about Gatorade now. That's that's for the after party. Um, as Annie just said, um, if you're new to the community, let us know because the History Matters community is a true community, and I believe I'm correct in saying that this is the 173rd Street episode, I believe. Um, history Matters, and so does Gatorade. Um, okay, so bad history. Um, I, as I halfway mentioned a few minutes ago, um, when I decided what I wanted to talk about today, I had to go digging around in past episodes because in one way or another, um, I have talked about bad history before. Um, I've talked about it in different ways. I've talked about it uh, with different logic. I, there are ever so many ways you could talk about bad history. Um, today, I want to be, I suppose you can say, maybe more specific uh, in talking about it. And, and also one insight that may or may not have caused an aha moment for you, but kind of did one for me. Um, but there are two things that inspired this for me this week. One is that the conference that I was at last week, um, I was on a panel and the panel was in one way or another grounded on Ron DeSantis's book, I believe the exact title is Dreams from the Founders, or Dreams from the Founding Fathers. I don't think he would forget fathers in that title. So I had to read that <laughs> and talk about it at this conference, um, as did several other historians, not just me. Um, but so I had to read Ron DeSantis's view of the founders. Uh, and boy, that took me a little while. Um, and I'm not going to specifically talk about that today, as tempting as it is. But it's related to what I want to talk about, um, which also is related to a second thing that within the last few days popped up, and that is um, in Florida, um, this new idea that slavery, uh, when it's taught, should be taught as um, providing useful skills for the enslaved. Now, I did not go and look up the precise language, so um, I'm going to hold back just a little tiny bit um, of my wrath. Um, but I will say, generally speaking, um, if you are saying that you can't teach slavery without showing its good side, if you're trying to both sides slavery, that is the ultimate blatant, most in your face, white watching of history, almost beyond belief, except not beyond belief, 
in 2023. Um, so obviously that got me riled up. And when I was thinking about that, wow, that's talk about bad history. History teaching that slavery, you know, it's bad. that's really bad history. Um, and then I thought, you know what? I also just read the Ron DeSantis book. So that brings us to where we are today. Now, I want to offer, um, before I plunge in here, um, a few myths about bad history and, and what I mean by bad history. Um, first of all, the idea of, and someone reminded me of this on some social media platform among the 892 that I am on at the current moment, but, um, and I wanted to address it anyway, but it's first because of this person, revisionist historians. Okay, so some people, when you move into the realm of what is good or bad history, they say, um, oh, well, all of you historians do bad history. You're all a bunch of revisionists. Okay, so let's just touch on that for a moment. Um, I once had, um, he's no longer my eye doctor, not for this reason. I actually suffered through this. But I once had a new eye doctor recommended by a friend, and he asked me what I did, and I unwisely said, I'm a historian. I teach early America. And he said, I hope you're not one of those revisionist historians. <laughs> And I wanted to exit stage left, but um, I did not. So what did he think he was saying? Well, he, he thought revisionist historians are these newfangled historians who keep changing things all the time in line with crazy ideas. What do you think? There's one history and we know it already. These newfangled revisionist historians. Well, speaking in a general kind of a way, all historians are revisionist historians. What we do as historians is we look for evidence. Sometimes we find new evidence. Sometimes we put together old evidence in different ways. Sometimes we ask different questions. Living in different times leads us to ask different questions. We do all kinds of things to try and gain new insights into the past. And then when we have new insights into the past, that are grounded historically in the past and informed by the fact that we're living in the present. So we have to remember that what we're doing and the questions we're asking are shaped by the present. We do all of those things. And then we talk to other historians and share our ideas and argue and maybe debate, maybe argue, um, have a, to use a word that everyone seems to be using these days, discourse. Um, we argue about what we find and we come up ideally with better ideas. It's called learning. <laughs> so yeah, um, I'm a revisionist historian because I believe in researching, asking different questions, not searching for myself and using history as a mirror. That is not what historians ideally do, but trying to get new insights testing the new insights against other people's insights, seeing if we can come to new understandings of the past, just based on the fact that there's a different set of brains with different sets of skills in a different historical moment researching the past. So yeah, I, I personally call that learning. Um, if you don't believe in learning, and I'm not gonna go on into that vein, but there are some people floating around these days who aren't very excited about learning. I'm going to come back to that towards the end of my comments. Um, but at any rate, all historians are revisionist historians, and that's not something dirty. It means we're researching, thinking, analyzing, debating, and gaining insights. That's all it means. Okay. Um, now that said, obviously, I do want to say um, we're doing all of those things. We're learning with some basic rules, like real evidence right? Actual evidence that we can find that exists in one way or another. And sometimes the absence of evidence is evidence, but regardless, evidence understood in historical context. So we need to understand what it was, when it was made, and how it was understood then. What does it tell us about then? And then if we want, what can that suggest to us about now? So, you know, um, when people um, Everyone in the world thinks they can be a historian. And many people who are not trained as historians can be good historians, but not everyone can be a good historian because you actually need some training. 
And you might be able to train yourself in much of this. I would say at the early part of my career, I did a lot of self-training and became a freelance historian doing that. I have no um, scorn for that. But that still means you have to use general historical standards and skills and they're there and you have to use them. And I will now stop ranting in that direction. Okay, so number one, bad history is that revisionist history is all history. So revisionist doesn't equal bad. Um, ideological is different and I'm gonna come back to that. Second, history can be bad. History has been bad. Not all of history is bad. A lot of history is bad, right? There is actual bad history. And to deny that is whitewashing history. It's very simple. It's a very straightforward thing. Bad things happened. For example, slavery. Slavery is a bad thing. It was a bad thing. It enslaved people against their will, tortured them, exposed them to all kinds of brutality, was inhuman. Why do I even need to say this? Slavery is a bad thing. It happened in the past. And in the United States, a lot of white people did this to black people. It's a fact, okay? That happened. How we deal with that fact, how we analyze it, how we think about it, the questions we ask about it, um, the conversation and discourse and arguments we have about it, there are many, many answers to that. But to pretend that somehow or other slavery wasn't so bad? What's fascinating about that to me is the logic of that. So if, if you're saying, and you actually come to the conclusion, which you advertise in some way, that to teach slavery, you have to teach that it gave people some job skills. I set the logic there for just a moment. Um, how does that logic work? Okay, so the person making that statement, number one, no slavery existed. Number two, no slavery was bad. Number three, feels compelled to pretend it wasn't so bad to make themselves feel better. That's it. There's no need to make up the crazy both sides and lies unless you actually all by yourself see that something bad happened in the past and you feel bad about it. I, why discomfort <laughs> is, is something that no one should feel ever about anything interesting. One factor I'll mention here, and then I will go on to the broader topic here. You know, there's a lot of discussion about how children shouldn't be made to feel discomfort in classrooms, and thus this kind of history, just the basic fact of slavery, for, for example, needs to be softened somewhat. Children aren't discomfited by this, it's their parents, right? The people who are saying, this is how we need to teach slavery. They're not thinking of the children. If they were, they'd be thinking about children who aren't white. What they're thinking about is the fact that they feel bad in some way, that's they're doing all by themselves, and they're deciding they'd rather not feel that way. So why not erase it, deny it, make it look nicer, okay. I want to move on to the topic at hand. I'm, I'm apparently a lot more riled up than I thought I would be recovering from the norovirus. So you guys got me this morning. Okay, so um, bad history can take many forms. And we're watching so many of them in action right now. Um, and obviously one of them, and I'm not going to go into um, great detail with some of these. We've talked about them before in one way or another specifically. But obviously um, one way in which bad history can have a really big impact is Supreme Court decisions. Now, this isn't necessarily a new phenomenon, but it's at the moment a particularly coherent and directed <laughs> phenomenon, right? There appears to be a court with one particular way of wanting to see things that is doing some particularly bad history as a group. Again, not the first time this has happened, um, but it's happening again and again and again. So as a historian, I need to point and say, Bad history. Why is it bad history? Okay, people are inventing doctrines that existed in the past, and then based on the fact that these invented doctrines existed in the past, 
they can justify things in the present. That's not very good logic. Or they find one little suggestive piece of evidence. And based on that one suggestive piece of evidence, they say, aha, the founders thought X and I have the paper, right? It's right here in writing. Okay, well, if you look at the paper and see who wrote it and when it was written and what was written around it and how it was viewed at the time, very often you'll find that the reason no one noticed it or said anything about it is because at the time, no one cared about it. At the time, no one believed it. And at the time, everyone contradicted it, right? That's some bad history too. If you are looking at history like a mirror, if you are looking at history to find yourself, that is not useful history. Maybe it's useful to you specifically. Maybe it's useful to you strategically and politically. But useful, meaning um, in good faith and actually educational and offering useful information that might help us move to a better place as a nation. Nope, that's not really going to do it. That's driven by contemporary ideological strategy. Now, I know there are people out there and they're going to be saying, well, the right aren't the only people who are shaped by ideology and do their history based on ideology. Right. We're all shaped in one way or another by who we are and where we are and when we are and personally what we think. And I know all of that. And as a historian, you know, I'm aware, yes, I am a liberal person, liberal in the political sense. Indeed, I know that. Um, and because I know that, I can evaluate sources and think about the questions I'm asking and the questions I'm not asking and what I see and what I don't see and think about what I might be seeing or not seeing or concluding or not concluding that might be a blind spot because of my assumptions and my what I might want to see. I'm not looking for what I want to see when I'm researching. I'm looking to see what the evidence says in as clear, straightforward and evidence-based a way as I can. So yes, left and right can be ideological, but at the moment, the right is very assertively um, erasing whitewashing um, or generalizing in a sweeping way about the past with one kind of goal. Now, it's also true, I'm trying to see where I found this. Somewhere online, um, I wrote half of this down, half of the quote down. Um, it says patriotism or bleep. Um, I, somewhere online, I saw someone um, essentially talking about how to some on the right, um, you're either patriotic or an America hater. And that's that's it, that's where you fall. Um, the DeSantis Dreams from the Founding Fathers book, you know, you either love the founder blob, you know, the founders, all in capital letters, or you hate America, right? That's, that's what it is. There are some people who might say, you can't love America if you understand all of the hate and violence in its past. I've talked about that in the past. I will briefly say now that I love America. I love this country. I can dream of what it can be. I can see the promise in what it was meant. Well, not meant to be, I'm not even gonna say that. In what it could have been in the past. And I believe in our ability to push it there. I do. Um, I love this country for its potential. I love this country for some of the greatness that has come from this country in the past. I also very readily acknowledge all of the extreme ugliness and disparity and exclusion and anti-democratic measures and everything else that actually happened and is part of who we are as a nation. I don't think you can fully love something unless you acknowledge its bad side as well and say, I see the bad side. I don't like the bad side. I'm gonna work towards getting the good side better and see what we could do about that bad side. But um, I don't think the options are patriotism or hating America. I don't think the options are hating America or being an extremist. 
I think th that there's a spectrum of views you can have about any country. Um, and so I don't think that dichotomy is particularly useful. And I think that makes it often very hard to talk about history. Because if you say anything remotely positive about a founder, not even the founders, but one, oh, so-and-so, actually it was kind of relatively anti-slavery, <laughs> not an activist, but relatively anti-slavery, okay. Um, sometimes you, you, know, you get clobbered, or if you say something semi-positive about someone who was also a slaveholder, yeah, he was a slaveholder and that's detestable. And he should not be forgiven for being a slaveholder. But if he wrote something that became a meaningful tool of progress for people down the road, I like that piece of writing and I'm glad that it helped some people raise themselves up down the road. So this is obviously complicated. Um, I'm gunning full steam ahead here because I'm running out of time. But at any rate, Supreme Court decisions, um, inventing doctrines, finding one little piece of evidence that actually at the time didn't mean anything, and then basing a whole way of interpreting the law on that one little piece of evidence. Um, or, and, and this was the insight I had this morning, and it might not be new to me, but it gave me a little aha moment. Um, it's also possible to find, a, you can, I always say to my students, you can find a quote from the past in history to say anything you wanted to say anything. Now, sometimes that means you actually just can find someone saying what you want, and it's not representative necessarily of the larger whole of evidence. Sometimes it means you're really selectively using evidence. And I want to offer an example here. Um, it's a, and I'm not going to talk about him, and I'm not going to talk about his book, because I have not read his book. It's just a particularly stellar example of what I'm talking about. David Barton, The Jefferson Lies, I have not read that book. I'm not going to talk about that book. But here's an example of um, strategically using a quote. So in December of 1809, John Adams, ex-president John Adams, wrote to his friend Benjamin Rush and said this. There is no authority, civil or religious. There can be no legitimate government but what is administered by this Holy Ghost. There can be no salvation without it. All without it is rebellion and perdition, or in more orthodox words, damnation. Okay, now David Barton took that quote and concluded that the founders were religious minded. They wanted a Christian nation, everything. There can be no legitimate government that's not administered by this Holy Ghost. How could you conclude otherwise? Let's read the second half of that statement. I'm gonna read it as a whole. There is no authority, civil or religious. There can be no legitimate government, but what is administered by this Holy Ghost. There can be no salvation without it. All without it is rebellion and perdition or in more orthodox words, damnation. All without it, although this is all artifice and cunning in the secret original in the heart, yet they all believe it so sincerely that they would lay down their lies under the ax for it. Alas, the poor, weak, ignorant dupe, human nature. <laughs> okay. Adams here is saying, and he says it later in another letter, um, the question before the human race is whether the God of nature shall govern the world by his own laws or whether priests and kings shall rule it by fictitious miracles. Uh, or in other words, whether authority is originally in the people or whether it has descended for 1800 years in a succession of popes and bishops or brought down from heaven by the Holy Ghost in the form of a dove in a file of holy oil. Okay, Adams is actually smacking partly at Catholicism, partly at priestcraft. Um, there's a, another quote that I didn't, I think, put down here, but it was like priestcraft, government craft, this craft, that craft. Adams was saying the precise opposite of what Barton wanted that quote to say. It's really easy to do that. And more often than not, people don't go to look up the other half of a quote, um, I, which I know only because I'm the person who will often do that, sometimes in student papers. And I don't come down hard on the heads of my students, but I will say, wow, if you read the whole sentence, he actually means the opposite, um, that it's important, right? That I, some of this I realize is very obvious, but important. Um, okay. 
Uh, but, but, but one other point I want to make because I say I'm really running out of time here. Okay, so bad history. Bad history can shape Supreme Court decisions, which thus in one way or another are shaping the law of the land and the nation in countless ways, right? So that's bad history doing a vast amount of damage. Um, bad history can also obviously shape elections. Um, if you're claiming that the founder blob, I have always called them for those who are new here, you know, the fact that there's a blob of founders and they all agree, all agreed on everything and they were demigods who believed only in eternal truths and had not a negative bone in their body. Um, if you believe that and you can get other people to believe that, and I'm going to come back to that point in a moment, then you can say to people, the, the basic idea of Ron DeSantis's book is, um, if you love the founders, you love us, these people on the, at the time, extreme right. If you like the other guys, if you believe the other guys, you hate the founders, okay? That's the argument of the book. It's actually about former President Obama, but that's the overall argument. Okay, so the founder blob, exists because it supplies a need, right? In one way or another. When you're saying the founders thought, um, even I say that sometimes. And then whenever I say it, I pause and I'm, I think, okay, like in what way is this sliding around over something that needs to be said? That's what everyone should do when they hear or say the founders thought. Um, oh, and I also want to say another thing that people do to shape elections with bad history. Um, and that all, again has to do with um, cherry picking and whitewashing and denying. Um, I mentioned this at this conference that I was just at. There's a very famous, or okay, maybe not very famous, famous to me um, quote about how Alexander Hamilton used George Washington's name and reputation. It's from the 1790s. So they're both still alive at this point. And I, I, it's from um, William McClay, Pennsylvania Senator William McClay's diary, actually. And McClay says, essentially, and this is a bad paraphrase, that Hamilton uses Washington's name and reputation as a washcloth to wipe away all of the dirt, wipe away all the murmuring. It's all good if George Washington's name and reputation is attached. And that's precisely the way that some on the right are using the founders. Okay, now um, I've talked before, I'm gonna round this off here now with this final point. I've talked before in, on a number of occasions about how you can stage some kind of takeover if you don't have the votes, you don't have the demographics and you're in a democratic form of government. What are some things you can do above and beyond warping the political system and overturning democracy, but let's start on a less dramatic level. What are some of the things that you can do that will help you retrench. And I talked before about courts, culture, and classrooms, right? The three Cs. Um, culture, I'm not gonna go into in great detail now, but I just did talk about courts. And of course, classrooms are another location of bad history doing severe damage. Because if you can, and, and I've talked before about how the Federalists in the early 19th century, um, very badly wanted to get control of colleges and universities, get Federalists in charge of them so that they could get the populace to believe good Federalist beliefs about things and not go drifting off with those more democratic Jeffersonian Republicans. And then America would be where America was supposed to be. So education as a strategic political tool makes sense for watching it happen all the times, all the time, I'm sorry. But obviously what you're doing, the way that that works is if you are training people in a classroom to see things a certain way and to not see other things at all. And in a classroom, when you're a kid, rather than being in a classroom and, and triple thinking and saying, I might be discomforted by this, you're believing what you're taught, right? You're taught, you believe it, you don't necessarily question it. The number of times as a historian um, that I've said something and people have responded by saying, I was never taught that, not in an accusatory way, but honestly, simply in a, oh, 
I didn't know. I didn't know that happened. I didn't know it existed. I didn't know that's what it really meant. Um, classrooms can open horizons and expand viewpoints and create potential, or they can put blinders on. And um, I don't think that by encouraging diversity, you're putting blinders on. I just don't. I think if you're encouraging diversity, you're encouraging democracy. Sue me. That's what I believe. So um, classrooms could be places where you deny, negate, whitewash, erase, warp the past in such a way that it can be invisible. It becomes visible when modern day political figures use that same bad history to get what they want and people go swimmingly along with it because they think that that's precisely what the history is. When you don't understand your past, you are lost in your present and you've surrendered your future. And that's a fact. When you don't understand your past, you have no idea how you got to where you are and you don't know how to construct a path to get to someplace else. You can't, you don't. You have to accurately understand the past in all of its complexity, in all of its diversity, in all of its negativity and positivity to have any kind of a grip on where we are as a nation. And right now as a nation, we have a real white supremacist problem and if you're denying any kind of racial conflict in the past, you're not erasing the problem. You're either saying the problem is the norm and we should just accept it, or you're saying, well, there's, there's, there's no problem. Is it a problem? No, the problem is you bringing all this negative stuff into our story. If your story is too shiny and pretty, it's a story, you know, <laughs> a national narrative isn't all shiny and pretty, it's complicated. There's conflict. You know, some of the greatest achievements in any nation's history comes from conflict. And I don't mean, you know, kill, crush, destroy. I mean, people who stand up for something that they want that other people don't want them to have and protest and commit to it, right? And, and there's conflict over ideas. And if a populace believes in something and says, you can't do that to us, we don't believe that's fair, we don't believe that's equitable, that can matter. I say this over and over again. Maybe this is, I'm drifting way over. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna conclude this here because this is not necessarily where I thought I would end. I got way too riled up. Yes, the mug is coming, Tom. Um, I got way too riled up, but um, I'm gonna repeat what I've said before because in this context, it, it matters. Um, be loud, speak up. If you see things that aren't right, if you see people claiming things that are blatantly wrong, lying, erasing, be loud, be loud and say, that's not what happened, but it's really interesting that you can't deal with this other stuff. Be loud, don't let it just happen. Don't let it squeak by. Because if you don't say something, it's gonna squeak by. And we can't afford any more squeaking. We need to protest as far as what's happening and what's being erased and who's being counted out. Because it's not gonna be just one group. We may be watching some people being counted out of the American picture right now, you can bet it's gonna be a lot more groups than that. So for, in the name of all that is inclusive and democratic about America, stand up for inclusion, stand up for democracy and good history can help us get there. Okay, I'm gonna stop. Um, I have way more energy than I thought I would have. That Gatorade, man, maybe that's the trick. History matters and so does Gatorade. Um, okay, so I, I'm guessing that probably a lot of you guessed generally speaking, what this mug would be, but it's a variation of the mug that I was going to pick. This is, a, I believe it's a Carolee mug. Carolee will say yes or no. History should make you uncomfortable. Ask questions, challenge assumptions, think, learn, right? Um, and I guess this comes from, um, sorry to say, 
a tweet. Someday there will be another form of social media that will have something like this. But for the moment, that's, I got a tweet. Um, okay, I'm gonna stop. I went 10 minutes over. Uh, I'm gonna open chat so I can see. You, there is always a tweet. <laughs> we went a little over, but we got a late start. So I, I don't worry about math. Okay, so we have so many good questions in the chat today. Um, Sydney has several in the chat and we've been having a, a side chat with Sydney because she's been asking so many good questions over here on the other side of the screen. And so everybody in our lovely community encouraged her like, put that in the Q&A, Sydney. So, <laughs> um, so I'm going to start off with a Sydney question and I'll sprinkle some other Sydney questions in there. Um, but she first asked the one that like really seemed to like excite everybody over here in the chat was a very simple question. Joanne, Sydney, and many of us want to know your thoughts on what makes a good historian. Oh, hmm. You, you come with the questions, man. Um, okay, what makes a good historian? Um, a silly answer is a willingness to sit by yourself alone in rooms looking at pieces of paper a lot, but that's neither here nor there. Um, well, I mean, I think a good historian, um, has to have some self-awareness, right? I mean, so there are many things that make a good historian. I'm not gonna cover them all here. Um, but you have to be aware enough of who you are and what you're thinking about and where you are and when you are and what you're asking to know that it's gonna shape what you see, right? So I don't think you can be oblivious to all of these things if you're gonna construct good history. You've gotta allow for them into the picture like um well there I, i'll come back to it i won't go into detail because i want to get to all the questions but at any rate so some of it has to do with your self-awareness of yourself as a historian some of it has to do with a real willingness to ask questions without obvious answers to let the evidence speak to you to churn through potentially a lot of evidence looking for patterns so being able to find patterns in things you know, there's a reason why um, people who, some people who go to graduate school and don't end up getting PhDs in history become law students and get become lawyers and vice versa. Former law students go and become history teachers because the same careful evaluation of evidence and construction and of patterns in, in pursuit of some kind of narrative, very similar skill base in of course, in court, you have a very specific purpose for that narrative, but still, same idea. And so I think a willingness to not necessarily be guided um, by your assumptions, by your desires, by your ideology, by what you assume is there. You know, some of my greatest moments as a historian have been surprise moments. What the what? Like, he said that? That? And that means this, what, right? It, it, it's your willingness to hear the evidence and see the evidence and let it speak to you. So it's silencing a certain voice in your head, a willingness to silence a certain structural voice in your head telling you how and what to think and opening your perspective enough that you might see something really new and different and that you're willing to not conclude something until you feel that you have enough evidence to say that it's true. I think I've already um, told the story about how there was one story in particular I wanted to tell in um, the field of blood about an abolitionist congressman standing up and giving an anti-slavery speech and one guy standing up with um, a gun and facing him, cocking the gun and then, a, guys with other guns standing next to the abolitionists. And so there are all of these guns in on, on the house floor. That's the proper expression, Annie, yes. And it was in the, a, a sort of autobiographical account of the guy, the abolitionist. So I could not believe that offhand because he would want that to be true because he would want slave holders to look bad. And I was not, I was down to the last couple of days when I was gonna have to send in the manuscript. And I was like, dang, I can't include it. I can't include it. Maybe in a footnote, I'll say, boy, do I want this to be true. I wouldn't have even done that probably because people weren't going to want to believe what I was saying anyway. So I was willing to surrender it until I thought 
I'm going to go to Ancestry.com because I never thought to go to Ancestry.com because it's not an academic database. And lo and behold, there someone for some reason had put an Ohio newspaper in there, which had a different account, but very obviously the same moment. And I got to include it in the book. Mm -hmm. So that make that's the making of a good historian, right? Is however much you want something to be true, you really have to prove it yep. to yourself and believe that you're proving it to others. I found a lot more violence than is in that book, but if I couldn't convince myself that it happened, it's nowhere. It's not in the book. Okay, I'll stop. No, that was great. Uh, and I also told Carolee we need a what the what mug because that was a good expression <laughs> when you said that. <laughs> well, that's a better way of saying the other what the. Yeah, yeah. I like it. I make a good mug. Okay. Um, Dave also has several questions. So here's a Dave question. He says, given the steep decline in tenure track positions for history professors, who will teach future K-12 history teachers when they're in college studying to become teachers? Are the liberal arts in US higher ed dying? Mm. Well, so um, th this conference that I was at, the Society for Historians of the Early American Republic had a lot of discussion. Um, not surprisingly, and not just in my panel about Florida, um, about history and history teaching, and many people were talking about um, history teachers of various kinds. I know, Nudie, it's really distressing, and I totally agree. Well married, ooh, tail wagging too. Um, at any rate, they, they talked about um, people leaving Florida, teachers of various kinds leaving Florida, leaving Texas, um, people, you know, making like security guards and schools sit in classrooms because they couldn't find enough teachers for positions. But someone did at one point sign up and make the very good point, which is, you know, a lot of this might be happening in K through 12, but um, folks, you college professors, you're gonna be getting students that have no understanding of what you think they should have an understanding of or have an understanding of something kind of wacky. You're gonna be facing this as college professors. So, you know, I, I think, I, well, I think we were at a moment where it, it, everything was STEM, 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 STEM all the time. I don't think we're quite at that moment anymore. Um, I don't know where we are particularly. I don't think, but I do think that history as a um, course of study and historians as a profession and becoming an academic, obviously that's in crisis. Um, and it's in crisis, obviously, at the precise moment that we we really need it. Um, all I can say to that is, um, and and you know, it used to be that I felt that my public-minded work was either ignored or actually scorned by a lot of my colleagues. I did it anyway, because you know, forgive me, but you know. <laughs> What the what? What the what? I'm going to do it because it's important, right? But I don't feel that anymore. And at the um, conference for the first time, multiple people came up to me and said, thank you for doing the work you do. Never happened before. Ever, ever, ever. So I think historians, some of us need to keep doing what some of us are doing, which is being sure to spread the knowledge and spread the importance and show why it's important. You know, there's a, constantly on social media, there's this like, historians never talk to anyone but each other, you know, or historians, all they do is talk to the public and they seek popularity. And no, you know, some historians talk to other historians, some historians talk to the public, some historians, I try, do both. Um, and there's a place for all of them. And I don't think one needs to cancel out the other. But some of us, particularly at this moment, for reasons academic, educational, historic, democratic, political, for so many reasons, we need to be talking to the public about history, what it is, and how they can reason about it, right? Because that's the other thing. You want people to think through history, to evaluate evidence, to think about different viewpoints and decide what they think, right? That's called learning, evaluating, that's training your mind to work. Memorization, this is what you should think, and um, slavery was not so bad, actually. Um, that's not training your mind to do a lot of thinking. 
um, that that's blinders history. So um, historians are rated E for everyone. Is that the, is that Sydney the same Sydney who's like on fire today? Okay. Yeah, but there's a lot of people on fire in the chat today. <laughs> Um, I mean, it's been, mm, I couldn't even keep up because I got so busy listening to you and trying to take notes. So, uh, all right. So we have a lot of Sydney and Dave questions, but I want to scroll through and make sure we don't ignore other thing. Let me say one thing, which I, I, I introduced as, a, as an interesting idea and then forgot to say it. Um, so I was thinking about the, the habit people have, bad history habit, uh, like Barton did, of taking a little bit of something and saying, look. And what I thought about this morning was, how do you quote from the Bible? People who are using the Bible strategically, what do they do? That's what they do. The Bible says, here, it's scripture. And I think that way of thinking, some people may think, works for historical evidence, which it doesn't. But that was my insight this morning was, um, and I'm not saying like, oh, religious people just don't know the right way to think. Um, I'm not letting them all off the hook. Uh, maybe some people don't know the right way to think. But what I am saying is, isn't it interesting that one of the main flaws in how people um, on the right, the evangelical folk who are preaching for religious nationalism on the right are using quotes from history is exactly the same way they would use quotes that they pull from the Bible. I will stop that because, um, yeah, the, the Bible isn't a book. Anyway, I just thought that was an interesting insight. It goes nowhere, but I was like, this morning, I was like, and then I went back to reading. So I'm sorry, so go on. Yeah, we, we again, you've lit up the chat. So, <laughs> okay, Jen G asks, how do we counter the prolific cottage industry promoting the idea that the US was founded as a Christian nation books, radio programs, movies, pulpits, where can we find resources to denounce this and refute friends and family who believe false these false claims? Well, you know, um, there are lots and lots and lots and lots of books that are written on the founders and faith, you know, the founding and religion. The problem is that um, all by themselves, those things are, they might inform you as you're going to talk to other people, but saying, hey, go read this book that totally disagrees with what you think might not work so well. Um, you know, one thing, how do I want to put this? It's very hard to confront someone who is really wrongheaded about something without starting with your fist clench because you're like, what? Like, you think what? Um, and if you can, not do that and actually kind of take a you know well that's interesting because it seems to me that every bit of evidence i've seen says the contrary like here's some really interesting letters and things that i found from a lot of the leading founders and they all say the opposite you know so i'm interested like why someone like you doesn't think that's true in other words and this is goofy and facile. And I realized it's like, oh, just have a conversation. But as I do always say, um, sometimes historical evidence can be very useful um, if you have the actual evidence. This is a real letter. Dear so-and-so, your humble servant. Boop. Um, there are lots of these, and this is what they say. That's one way to do it without saying, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. But instead saying, well, you know, I've evaluated a lot of evidence and it doesn't, that's not what it, says yeah a um, newbie man newbie's on fire i don't know what you've done to him but he has a lot to say people are loving it they're mentioning we usually don't hear him like that it's great no he's been all this week he's been yelling I, which, it actually has me a little concerned i'm like what's what's the deal news like he's <laughs> he just did this <laughs> You have to get a newbie cam because some days you just need to have a little pick me up and a newbie cam would be a great pick me up or duff is tail wagon he's i don't yeah, know man. okay i can see the memes now like we could have excerpts from different cable news shows and then intersperse it with newbie just going off that would be very fun 
<laughs> well, on the podcast, he did on the podcast where we were talking about the election of 1844 and Henry Clay and how Henry Clay was a problematic presidential candidate and he went berserk. <laughs> really sorry. There was a lot calmer about Henry Clay now. Anyway, I'm sorry. Go on. Um, okay, here's our buddy Miranda. Miranda asked, how do you fight against bad history when you don't have the academic credentials? I often find myself, for example, discussing incidents about Lincoln's life against a PhD who knows more than I do, but despite myself living in Lincoln's hometown of Springfield, studying her life through reading and lecture, I'm not an expert by any means, but pointing out Lincoln's flaws as well as his you know, good attributes she thinks is important. So I've been put in this situation. Now that I work with Ed, people keep assuming I'm a professor, right? And they'll say, well, Professor Evans, and then I'll politely correct them and say, no, I'm a K-12 teacher. Ed is the professor. We're a team, you know. And, and as soon as I say I'm not a professor, I've actually had them turn their body to almost like, and then start talking to Ed. So then he'll move. Like it's happened a couple of times. Wow. Yeah. And it, and it, you know, he'll say something like, um, oh, I'm sorry. I know you didn't mean to like, like he, he you know, how he is. <laughs> yeah, but it, it's, there've been a couple of awkward moments. There've been moments where people basically just tried to dismiss me because of that. And then someone actually said like, why is she even on this panel? She doesn't have a PhD. And it's hilarious. He said, she doesn't need one. <laughs> we love Ed. We do. But um, but I, I get it, Miranda. And I, I think, um, I, OK, I'm, I'm going to be quiet. I'm just here. Joanne's answer to that. Well, there's two sides. So one one side, the question, I think, is kind of asking, what do you do when there is a Ph.D. and you want to disagree with them, but you don't have a Ph.D.? Um, you know, that's a moment where some useful questions. Oh, that's really interesting that you believe that. Like what what evidence like what led you to believe that? And not in a snarky way, like sincerely, because you're thinking to yourself, <laughs> like, that's not true. But so, OK, I'm really curious what led you to think that. Um, and depending on what they say, your answer might be, I didn't think of it that way. Or it might be, well, yeah, that's true. But what about these 18 other things? So, you know, you can open a, a discourse, a conversation that way. Um, and again, I know work really well, but at least it's kind of opening a possibility, um, an evidence-based possibility with someone regardless of degree. Now, what you're talking about, Annie, is people who are like, oh, you, you know, I don't care what you have to say. It's the, it's the flip side. You don't have a PhD. I don't care what you have to say, um, which is, it, it's like beyond wrong. But, you know, if, if someone comes up to me and says, again, some of it's tone, someone comes up to me and says, you damn elite Yale people who think you know everything, you don't know everything, did you know? You know, and it's gonna be bad. <laughs> because that's actually not trying to have a conversation. That's not asking a question. That's, um, that's I dare you history, right? That's not useful. Um, if you come up to me and were to say to me, you know, you said during your lecture, blah, blah, blah. I've always thought blah, blah, blah. Actually, what I just said. So how do you, where, how did, how did you get to your thing? And I supposedly would be able to say, well, here's why. And I read this and I think this and blah, blah, blah. But I want to hear your, what you think. And we, again, conversation. That would be like a normal way that two people with ideas can engage with each other regardless of the degrees that people have. It's probably the tone. It's when people actually particularly want to smack you because you have a degree and they're like, oh, you guys, you never know anything. You're, you know, fill in the blank. Um, we all know better than you, silly academics, blah, blah, blah. The, you know, the same people who don't want to acknowledge that anyone in any academic field has any kind of training that matters at all, or, you know, medicine <laughs> who needs medical training you know i mean we're at, we're at, we're at a moment of ridiculousness on many fronts and historian is just a little part of it yeah uh okay so greg asks has joanne had the opportunity to be exposed to how the history of the u.s is taught in other countries if so what kind of insights might that have given you or would you consider based on that experience oh that's interesting um 
Well, what I haven't done yet, and what I would be very willing to do, is to spend like a semester or a year teaching in another country, teaching American history in another country, because that would be fascinating. I've just had, um, I spent a semester in England uh, during a, doing a semester abroad in college. Um, and I went to a conference about democracy in China. Um, and both of those things were revealing, particularly in the case of England where I kept my mouth shut a lot because I didn't want people to know I was American. I just wanted to be another person in the class and kind of see where it went. Uh, and that was particularly true with a class on um, Judaism that I took, American Judaism. Uh, that, that I ultimately lost my cool and I, I blew it. But, and I was like, I didn't like that class so much. But at any rate, um, you learn because what you learn, and as a historian, I will often say in an early American context, if you really want to understand something about what the United States seems like or looks like in a time period, find someone from another country visiting the United States. They will tell you amazing things. They might not be right, but it's what they're seeing and thinking, and that will give you such a different perspective. French visitors to the United States, for example, um, in the late 18th, early 19th century, boy, did they see and say interesting things. Now, again, as a historian, where were they coming from? What were their assumptions? What are they assuming they're going to see? Uh, what do they have cultural and political baggage that they're bringing with them? But they always say things that Americans wouldn't say. Like, I remember finding... Um, a French person who was in the United States in like 1790, so right when the new government is launched, 1789, 1790, and he said to someone, um, I'm not gonna do it justice, but it's something along the lines of, um, there's a lot of British rust left on everything here. Mm. Like they haven't brushed off all the old British rust, which stayed with me. I probably found that 30 years ago, because what an evocative, interesting way to say something that makes absolute sense that it was there at the time, but it took a foreigner to be like, you know, or another French visitor that was like, Americans act, these, these American politicians, it's like they're walking on a tightrope all the time. Like they're afraid they might fall off at any moment. It's like, well, yeah, I see that. I write about that, but thank you very much, random person from France who saw it and commented on it so that now I can quote you. Um, so. The underlying part of that question, which is go to another country, uh, look at how they see America and how you see America from another country, and, and that could show you a lot. I mean, being in England, the first time I was out of the United States, I think, other than Canada, um, and, and I took part in a Roman ar archaeological dig, found like, you know, ancient Roman little artifacts. My country looked like so new and plastic when I got home. <laughs> I was like, wow, are we a young country? <laughs> Just never understood it before. Well, plastic meaning shiny, new, you know, fake, kind of. So, like a Barbie yeah. dream house? <laughs> like a Barbie dream house, exactly. Yeah, guess what we're talking about with my with the podcast today? Barbie? The history, the meaning, and what the what. But anyway, I'm sorry. Go. Oh. Um, all right, Greg, that was a good question. All right. Kathleen V asks comments on the Hillsdale College 1776 curriculum emphasizing American exceptionalism. Right. She's asking if you have any thoughts. On that. I do. Um, so I'll, I'll start with one um, statement. Oh, geez, I thought that was turned off. You just became a student in my class. <laughs> I seriously thought it was turned off, guys. So, so sorry. We all turn oh. looking. Annie? <laughs> no. Um, Take my cell phone, professor. <laughs> yes, I'm taking that cell phone from you. Um, oh, my I, mother. I have a cell phone um, story in a classroom that I'll tell in the after party. Um, the American exceptionalism question. Um, I said something actually years ago, and I still believe it to be basically true. And that is that Americans' fundamental belief in American exceptionalism is absolutely blinding them to what's happening all around them. I think it's fine to say that there are things you love about your country, 
that there are things that you think are distinctive about your country. You can say many, many things, but to say we are exceptional and the rest of history doesn't apply to us, what's happened to the rest of the world won't happen to us. I used to say that that was silly, but now within the last decade, I'm just gonna say dangerous. It's dangerous. I have been yelling, preaching, singing, teaching, writing, lecturing, podcasting, webcasting, for many years now that it can't happen here needs to be tossed out the window. It can, it is, we need to confront it. And if we sit around saying, I just, I just had an exchange with someone on, I think Birdland uh, Twitter. And I said Perfect. something it wasn't even, I, I always call it Birdland. Um, I, I can't even remember what I said. It wasn't even anything that dire. I think it was about third party threats. Right. It was like because our podcast this week was about third party candidates and the threats they present to actual candidates. And some person beamed in who, who I think probably agrees with my politics and said, eh, Democrats will win. It's fine. It's always fine. It'll be fine. And it was all I could do not to yell. <laughs> I was like, that's really not something that a person should be thinking right now because uh you know and i i talked very briefly about it and this person was i think was a guy not going to be shaken it's all fine it's always been fine that is right now not logical not useful not safe because things are going to happen whether you believe they can or not so american exceptionalism can be another form of denial another form of historical denial um so I think we need to be careful about it because we have a long and storied history of thinking that anything that happens anywhere else can never happen here because we're different and we're special. And we've seen countless ways in for many, many years, that's just not true. I remember realizing that with a painful kind of smack over the head in a way that I hadn't before, 9-11, um, right? I think some part of me had thought, well, we're far away from those other countries. So stuff happens there all the time. But, you know, unless it's a war, like we we are far away in some way. We have a little bit of a barrier. And, you know, 9-11, it was like, nope. Uh, and I should have realized that in my gut before. And I didn't have to. And now, I, so, okay, I'll, I'll stop. But uh, um, American exceptionalism right now uh, is dangerous. Yeah. Okay, um, we have, let me scroll back up. Um, okay, so Tom is asking about your thoughts on the 1776 project in the context, which is a little different from the Hillsdale. That was the one that Trump put his version of historians together to refute 1619. So do you have any thoughts on that? Well, the 1776 project project was the presidential commission right uh it was the one that trump put together right but the, the Hillsdale college is a separate one that they right. put together oh got and it. both have been offered in different states depending on uh, uh, you know to try and thwart the um 1619 standards that were put together by committees such as what happened in virginia Hillsdale college was the one that they consulted with when they tried to rewrite ours but the trump 1776 project or 1776 unites is what it, I think they ended up calling their final draft. Um, it was put up about a month before the switch from the two executive uh, you know, exchanges of power. So Trump actually put it up a month before he left office basically. So it was very performative. Right. Um, it was literally taken down the morning of Biden's inauguration and that now you have to hunt through the National Archives to get it. We actually link it to our, we have a lesson um, at New American History that's comparing 1619 Project to the Trump one. So we had to go dig into the archives and put the link in after they broke it. Um, so he's just wondering if you had any thoughts on that one. That was um, supposed to be the response to the Well, so, so the, I have a lot of thoughts on it, but given that we're already a little over, I'll, I'll, I'll focus on one, one thought. Um, and I glanced a little at 1619 stuff this morning and at that response to it, um, just not knowing in what direction I was going to go when I was talking. Um, so part of what the 1619 Project is doing was saying, let's, let's change 
let's radically change our center. And what if we say we're going to go back to the to 1619 and look at a different base for America? 1776 project said no. <laughs> It was that document in 1776. That's what started everything, the document, right? And documents are important and that document's important and it has things in it that are important, but it was not a flawless document. It did not accomplish everything it was even intended to accomplish. Never mind the things it wasn't intended to accomplish. But that was initially one group saying we've written slavery out. It has to be in and it has to be central and another group saying no. Um, and I know, and again, I'm not gonna go into great detail. Um, there was an initial claim in the 1619 project that um, the United States, the Revolutionary War was grounded on a desire to defend slavery. And there was a protest about that. And that statement was weakened. And that caused a lot of the fuss. Like, ah, no, the revolution wasn't about defending slavery. And we could talk about that another time as to why that rang all kinds of bells and made a lot of people bonkers. Um, but at its heart, that was, we need to rethink our history and understand that slavery is at the center of it in some way. And if we can get past the document and ground it in people, maybe that will work. And someone else saying, nope, document, that's it. So this partly has to do with how we define history. And, and how we define the nation. And I think our documents um, are, are, as um, Pauline Mayer put it, um, the American scripture that we have, the Declaration of Independence, matters profoundly, um, but so does the history of our people. I will, I will stop there and we are now at 11 minutes after, so we should probably at least have a little time for the after party. This was an excellent discussion. Oh my gosh. Uh, so we still have seven really good questions. Maybe we should just continue, you know, after party a little. We could, no, 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 no. Next week. Next week. Oh, I love that idea. Um, send, John, can send you send questions? me the questions? John, can you send us both the questions at the, when you log off? Because we don't have a way of copying them the way we do with the chat. And um, if something else happens next week, this is what we always do with my podcast. Something else happens and we're like, no, 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 no. Um, we will find a way to do both things next week. But let's continue this because there's so much to say. And I was cutting myself short right. every answer. This was, this was yeah. a great conversation, you guys. I don't feel quite as sick as I did before. Look at this. Um, okay, so here's what's gonna happen now, a little late. Um, we are going to head off into the after party. What that means is that we will no longer be recording so that we can be even freer and easier in our conversation than we were before. Um, if you have beamed in through the NCHE website, just stay right where you are and poof, you will be in the after party. If you are watching on Facebook, you need to leave Facebook and go to nche.teach.org slash conversations. And then you too will poof, be in the after party. Okay. Um, so I do want to say as ever, but particularly this week, because I've missed you guys and because these conversations are so important. And I think my flaming emotion today <laughs> shows you how much I believe that, right? Um, thank you for engaging in these conversations. Thank you for being here to debate, discuss, and defend democracy. Um, however many of us are here, it's important that we're doing this and that we're sharing it and spreading it around. So thank you for forming this community and being willing to do this week after week for 173 weeks. Um, I will see you all next week. Um, thank you to Annie and John as ever um, for being part of the wonderful community and for being my um, colleagues and making this possible. I missed you guys. We missed you, we were worried about you. Yeah, well, the, the, the near concussion and the norovirus I, I was feel really glad I missed the neurovirus, but oh, I was, that's okay. Yeah, I I was out of town working, and it was kind of crazy. We can talk I, about that after the party. I think I, I think I, I, I think I commented about it like the day after everything was horrible. But anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, okay, let's at least have a little time for the after party. Um, and just so you know, Joanne, John has to take his puppy to the vet. His puppy's not feeling well, so we need to end around eleven thirty. We don't get to. We, we can't That's go. Fine. Oh, John, I'm so sorry. I know, I know. Everybody's 
animals and people. <laughs> oh, I know. Okay, so we'll so even I just want to make sure we're mindful of John's time because we want his puppy to get to vet. We'll we'll just have a slightly shorter. We'll we'll um, end a couple minutes even before eleven thirty, so you can get to the vet. Um, nope. Uh, that was not said. Active chat today. Today's chat was on fire. <laughs> I I can even see from the little bit that I got. I was um oh we're still.